This morning, I want to conclude a lesson that we've been looking at, men who have failed Christ, that Christ, while here upon this earth, he did have many individuals who failed him. Many did not. Many were very faithful and continued with him. But there were those who failed him. And we need to learn from their mistakes so that we do not repeat them. <clears throat> and so we've looked at people like Herod, who for selfish le reasons failed Christ. He had the desire for his own selfish, his selfish kingship, and he thought Jesus would be a threat to that kingship, so he failed Christ and murdered uh, children two years and under. Christ's own people, that states in John 1 11, he came into his own and his own received him not. They thought that he was too commonplace. We know his mother, his dad, his brothers and sisters. And likewise, many would fail Christ today because they think that he's too commonplace. They reject the Bible, it's too simple, and it was written a couple of thousand years ago. What does it have to say to us? We need more and better people who are well qualified to write something, or simply the simplicity that is in Christ. They try to make Christianity far more difficult than it is. Many of Christ's disciples it says in John the sixth chapter, went back and walked no, walked no more with him. These people were shown the demands of the gospel. And as a result, those demands were too great as they thought, and so as a result, they deserted him. Many today, feel the demands of Christi Christianity are just too great. The demands on my time, on my abilities, on my thinking, on what I, how I live and what I say and what I do, they're too great. I want to live my own way and so they forsake Christ. Judas, because of his love of money, forsook Christ. He was, in reality, a thief. And that love of money, we see that he's a thief in, Matthew, uh, in John the 12th chapter, verses 12 through verse, or verse 3 through verse 6. And as a result, later on, he goes to the Jews, the Sanhedrin, and says, what will you give me and I'll deliver him? And so they made an agreement for 30 pieces of silver, a love of money. People love money today and that the goods and the things that it can provide for them. And because of that, they forsake Christ. Peter is another illustration of one who was a faithful follower of Christ, but yet he failed him. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus told Peter as after he had gone away and prayed and comes back, finds Peter and James and John sleeping and says, why are you sleeping? You need to watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. But they went back to sleep instead of watching and praying after Jesus is taken by the mob. Peter begins falling afar off. He didn't want to be too close. And as a result of following afar off, he denied Jesus three times. And finally, in that third time, calling evils upon himself if he was not in telling the truth, invoking divine harm upon his own self. Many individuals today don't want to be too close to Christianity. They want to, in reality, enjoy the blessings of it, the benefits of it, but they don't want to get too close. Keep it at arm's length as we would, as we would put it. 
And so they don't really worship like they should. They don't serve God as they should. They let those things go. Why? Because they want to follow Christ, but they want to follow him afar off. Christ's disciples, you know, all of them said, we'll not forsake you. And yet when it was, it, when it came down to it, it says in Matthew 26 and verse 56 that all the disciples forsook him and fled. Why did they do it? Primarily because they were afraid. Here's a mob who has come to take Jesus. And because of the fear that that invoked within them, them they fled and forsook Christ. It's easy to become afraid today. Afraid of friends and position and job and all of these things because persecution will come upon the Christian. And many times we're afraid of the ridicule that might be associated with us. So we fail to speak up on his behalf. We fail him because of fear and we allow that fear to overtake us but we need to be reminded that God has not given us a spirit of fear but a power and of love and of sound mind the false witnesses Sanhedrin needed witnesses two witnesses at least to crucify or to put Jesus to death and so they went out and sought witnesses that was illegal by itself so that they could put him to death. But yet, all of these witnesses come and testified one thing against another, but they didn't have an agreement as to their testimony. And finally, two of them come and say, well, this person said that he is able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. False witnesses that lied about the truth. We are one that there's going to be false teachers today. False teachers came during the first century. They have come every century since. And we have false teachers today. There's those false teachers who are outside in the world, the denominational groups. But yet, there's false teachers that arise within the church of our Lord as well. Paul warned the Ephesian elders that even of their own selves, the eldership, there would be men arising to speak perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Those false teachers today fail Christ. Instead of teaching the truth, they lie about our God. Pilate is another one that forsook Christ or failed Christ. Starting in Matthew 27, we'll start in verse 11 and read through verse 26. Matthew writes, And Jesus stood before the governor. <coughs> and the governor here is, of course, Pilate. And the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest, by the way, notice that all he did was make an a, a affirmative statement. You have stated it. He didn't state it himself. He just agreed with the statement. Later on, Peter would say, say that he made the good confession. How did he do it? By his agreement. By saying, you said it. Thou sayest and when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. Now at that feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And, and they had a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, whom will, ye whom will ye that I release unto you? 
Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ. For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. And when he had sat down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, and saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governors answered and said unto him, Whether the twain we that I would release unto you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said unto him, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be upon us and our children. <clears throat> And then released he Barabbas unto them, and when they had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. <clears throat> Here's Pilate. He's the governor. He's the ruler of the area. He has examined Jesus and knows there's nothing that he has done worthy of death. He can realize, because he sees the situation that has arisen, that the rulers of the people have delivered Jesus to him to be put to death because of their envy. And yet, here he is. This time comes, I can release one of two men. Barabbas, an evil man, or Jesus. Which one? And they said, release Barabbas. What do you want me to do with Jesus then? He's done nothing wrong, and his wife had even sent him a message, have nothing to do with that just man. Notice what she calls him, a just man? Pilate knew he had done nothing wrong. Pilate's wife knew that he had done nothing wrong. If you want to go back to Herod, he was tried before Herod, and Herod knew he had done nothing wrong. Every time he had a trial, the sham trials, the people knew he didn't do anything wrong, and yet what happens? They crucify him anyway. But Pilate, he stood in an unusual situation because he's the ruler of the area. He's the one who actually has the right to put him to death or to release him. It didn't matter what the people wanted. He had the right. It rested on his shoulders. But what does he do? Well, I want nothing to do with it. He tried to be neutral. You know, as we go back into the wars that we've had, these world wars that we've had, and every one, there's these nations that decide they're going to be neutral. We're not going to take either side. We're not going to be try and be advantageous to either side. We're not going to try to be disadvantage, uh, disadvantaged to either side. We just don't want to do anything in it. Be totally neutral. That's Pilate. He knows Jesus is a just man, but here's all of the crowd, all of the people, and I want to please them. But Jesus has done nothing wrong, so you know, what should I do with him? Well, I'll just give him to you. You do what you want to with him. He tried to be popular instead of doing the right thing. But popularity is dangerous. Christians are, by the very nature of being our Christ, to be separated from the world. 
Paul would write in Romans 12, verses 1 and verse 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. If you want to take Pilate's position, he wanted to be conformed to the people instead of leading the people. The Christians are not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Christians separated from the world, not to be conformed to it. We are not to be like the people in the world. Paul would say in Ephesians 5 and verse 11, to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. The whole world lies in darkness. We are walking in the light. And he says, we as people walking in the light are not to have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. What we are to do is to reprove it, to correct it, to point out its error, to say here is sinful. You shouldn't be doing these things. That, though, does not make one popular. If old Joe Blow over here is engaged in this activity, and we come along and say, you know, Joe, that activity is wrong. It's sinful. It's evil. You need to stop. Uh, old Joe Blow's going to say, shut up. I don't want to hear it. I'm going to be doing what I want to do. And there are going to be troubles. That's the idea of reproving it. Have no fellowship with it. You don't join in the evil with them. But you reprove it. Why? Because Christians are not seeking to be popular. Popularity is not priority with Christians. Godly living is to be the priority of Christians. Paul would say that we are not to set our affections on things, we are to set our affections on things above and not on things of the earth. He recognized our affections can either be here upon this earth and the things of this earth and all of the things of this earth that the earth does, the evils that it's engaged in. But he says we are to set our affections on things above. In other words, spiritual matters. Our affections are to go to God. We're to love him first and foremost within our life. A love for Jesus. A love for the church. A love for faithful Christians. Our affections are to go there, not on things of this earth. The person who's seeking popularity, his affections are on the things of this world. James would put in in James 4 and verse 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. We want to be the friend of the world. That's one of the things that bothers me about these congregations today that announce a friendship day, a friendship evangelism. We're not to be friends of the world because that's enmity with God. Our friendship is to be with God first and foremost. That doesn't mean we can't have a friend and we shouldn't be inviting those friends. Yes, we should. But there's an attitude of difference between the people of the world and the people of God. The things of this world and the things of God. 
And that's where our affections are to be with the things of God and not the things of the world. John would put it in 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17, to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Again, a strong contrast, either love of the world or love of God. And if you love the world and all of the things of the world, then you do not love God. Love of the, of God, uh, the love of the Father is not in you. Pilate, in that situation, tried to be the friend of the world. He sought the popularity of the world instead of being and doing what was right. What was right was releasing a just individual. Someone who had not committed any crime. Someone who was not deserving of death. Pilate didn't have the moral fortitude to do it. Because he sought the world and popularity with the world. In John the 12th chapter we have an illustration of this. In verses 42 and 43. When it says, nevertheless, among the chief, pre chief rulers, also many believed on him. That's being believing on Christ. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Now notice this. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. They believed Christ, but they loved the praise of man more than the praise of God, and so they would not confess him. And no doubt, yes, they were afraid of being put out of the synagogue. That was a serious matter in those days. They would have been cast out. It's as if they did not exist. They couldn't go to the local grocery store and buy something because it didn't exist to the Jews anymore. That's how serious it was to be put out of the synagogue. They love the praises of men more than God. But while in wars within our history, nations have been neutral and it was allowed to be neutral, in this conflict there is no neutrality. Jesus would put it in Matthew 12 and verse 30 that he that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Now, there's no neutrality there. If you're not with me, you are against me. Which side are you on now? Are you with Christ or are you against him? And yet a lot of people want to stay in that neutral area. Well, we don't really want to be against Christ. I mean, but being for him means doing all of these things and living this way. I don't want to do that either, so I'm not really, but I don't want to be against him. Well, you are. If you're not for him, you are against him. That's what he says. And in, in, as Paul talks to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 4, he says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Our Lord chose every Christian to be a soldier in the army of God. We are not to entangle ourselves with the affairs of this world. A person is, in reality, either a part of the problem or they are part of the solution. There's no in-between. 
if you're not a part of the solution, if you're not on the part of Christ, if you're not for him, then you are a problem. You're part of the devil and his forces. The last one that we'll mention is the soldiers. Matthew, the 27th chapter, starting in verse 27 and going through verse 31. It says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gave unto him the whole band of, of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet rope. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and looked and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put on or put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. These men in reality had no special malice against Christ. And yet they were doing these things. These men were just very simply calloused, hard-hearted. They didn't care. If you could call them before to to testify and ask them the question, how many men did you do this to or like this to? The answer might have been in the thousands, hundreds. Crucifixion was something that was very common in that day. Literally streets were lined with people being crucified going into certain towns for miles and miles there would be crucifixions on both sides of the road as they would enter the town after a few times they became calloused it didn't affect them i imagine the first time that they experienced it it might have caused some you know Flittering of the stomach, a little bit of uneasiness. A few hundred times, oh, who cares? They were calloused, hard hearted. And so when Christ comes along, yeah, he's king of the Jews. Okay, we'll just do this to him. Put a robe on him, purple robe. We'll give him a crown. It's going to be a thorn. And we'll beat those thorns down into us. They didn't care. They didn't have any special hatred for Christ. It was just that they didn't care. They were hard-hearted. It's like a lot of people today. If you go out in the, into our society, meeting people on the street, and you start asking them and talking to them, do you have anything against Christ? Well, no but they don't care about him either. They don't have a hatred for him. They just don't care about him. They're not trying to do necessarily anything to harm Christ or Christians. They just don't care. They're calloused. They've been brought up in a way that they've been hardened by sin. In Hebrews 3 and verse 15, the Hebrews writer makes a statement, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. He was calling upon the Old Testament illustration where the Jews had hardened their hearts. And he is warning these Jews now don't harden your hearts. Because it can get to the point where you cannot bring yourself to repentance. You won't repent because your heart is so hardened, it's so calloused by sin and wickedness 
that you've reached the point of, as we might call it, the point of no return. Could Christ save an individual like that? Absolutely, if they will repent. But the problem is they won't repent. Their hearts are just hardened by the sin and the wickedness that they are lived, and so they don't care. They don't care about Christianity. They don't care about spiritual matters. They don't care anything about if they even believe in an afterlife, which so many of people now don't. They've just been hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And so, the Hebrew writer warns them, today if you hear his voice, listen to what he says, allow it to make its inroads within you because your heart can be seared over with sin to such an extent that it won't even affect you. Just like the soldiers, it did not affect them any at all as they beat, as they mocked, as they crucified our Lord and Savior, a just man. You know, someone who is an iron worker, works with hot instruments all the time, a blacksmith, can go up and grab something and it not even affect their hand that if I went up and started to grab it, I would release it real quick and my hands would be scorched. What's the difference between the two? My hands are soft. They work on a typewriter all day. They're not callous. That person's been working with that heat all of his life and his hands have become calloused and hardened so that the heat from that instrument doesn't have any effect upon him while it does mine. We need to be careful that we don't get and allow our hearts to become hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And so Paul's message in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2 and he says, for he, hath heard the in, or for he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Are you failing Christ within your life? If so, then repent of your sins. Allow God's word to have its effect upon your heart so that you will turn from that wicked way, that sinful way, and you will turn to him and live for him. If you've never obeyed that gospel, Jesus Christ, allow the gospel to make its effect upon your heart this morning. Repent of your sins. Make the confession of your faith that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then let us baptize you in water for the forgiveness of your sins and begin living that life that God wants you to live, where you will not be failing Christ, but where you will be living in the way that he will be approving of. If you need to come, do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.